Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. See, researchers know how to have fun, too. Um, now I'd like to bring up uh, Dan Ling, who's a corporate vice president head of our Redmond lab here in Microsoft Research. He's going to, for about the next 45 per hour, something like that, um, share with you some of the technologies that have been long-term investments for us here in Microsoft Research that have really been seeing big payoff uh, uh, most recently, and tell you a, bit, a little bit about that and actually bring up some of our other researchers to share some of the demos with you. So we have a number of stations, and he'll sort of be walking around and sharing that with you. So Dan, come on up. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Good morning again, and welcome to our uh, 15th year anniversary event. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to take a look at a few demos and chat with some of the researchers. But since we only have about an hour or so, we're only seeing uh, a very small slice of the work going on at Microsoft Research. But hopefully it will be a, a fun peek into the kinds of things that we're doing here. So for the first project, um, we're, for about the entire 15 years, close to the entire 15 years, we've made a very heavy investment in a technology called Bayesian inference where uh, the technology allows you to reason even under situations of uncertainty and then to have the software take action uh, based on uh, what, what it's reasoned and based on the preferences of the users to take perhaps an optimal line of action. And so we've used this technology to do a, a whole variety of different things. But one area that we've applied it in is to taking a look at how we can conserve the user's attention. Uh, our attention is a very scarce resource. It's certainly not growing uh, according to Moore's law. And it's consumed by uh, almost all software programs as if you had all the intention in the world to devote to it. And so in the cases where you have, for example, tons of communications, you'd like the software to be a little bit more intelligent and to conserve the user's attention. Uh, let me turn it over to Eric Horvitz to show you a little bit about our work in this area. Thanks, Dan. So for about uh, five or six years now, we've been looking very carefully at, um, at models of attention, building statistical models that can actually um, infer um, uh, uh, how busy somebody is at any, <coughs> at any time, and as, as well as, uh, as we should bring, bring, bring up the uh, monitors here, uh, as, as well as uh, what, what, what the cost of interrupting a person might be at any time. Um, this work actually led early on to us taking an economic model to attention uh, in that we have built systems that can trade off um, a user's uh, focus of attention with the value of being aware of communications of a variety of kinds. And that meant not just uh, building sensory systems like you see up here that could track where I was looking at any time, and my laptop's also listening to me right now to understand that I'm having a conversation, but also to understand the value of staying aware, the value of staying aware of urgent information, of being um, available for phone calls, and so on. Um, one of our early projects was called Priorities here. And uh, it's still being used around Microsoft. It's led to several products. Um, and this system actually learns uh, by watching you work with email to understand which email messages are the urgent ones. Uh, in this case, uh, a message from Paul Koch and Ying Lee are considered much more, mess uh, much more urgent than uh, a message from Rick Rashid today um, talking about, uh, I think, our, our anniversary, which is kind of important but not urgent. So uh, that's how the that system works. Now, we, we combine the valuation of urgency with the cost of interruptions. Uh, and so priorities actually not just considers the, the value of looking at email and being aware, but also at how costly it is at any time, as well as when you'll next look at email for the mobile applications of the situation, of, of, the, of, of the tools here. Um, uh, these systems uh, led to broader applications of technology where we combine telephony with computing. Um, exploring the unification of phone and computer uh, in a way that uh, led to prototypes that were used, uh, one of which was called uh, BESCOM ET, 
by 12,000 Microsoft employees for several years. And that project went off, and, and uh, the code base evolved into what we call today Communicator, which is shipping as of, as of several months ago, as well as the live communication ser server at the back end. So I'd like to just to highlight those, those, those core notions here. Right, that's great. I mean, this is a great example of a technology investment that we've made for many years and has really led to impro important product impact here at Microsoft. Another topic that, that Eric will show us something about is in the area of search. And in this case, what we've tried to do is go beyond the actual search tool itself and think about the entire search process and the whole activity that the user goes, uh, that surrounds uh, doing the actual search and the context around doing the search and how we can actually engage and stimulate the user's memory. So. Um Memory-like attention is a, a key pillar of cognitive psychology. And uh, it, it, it's just another example of how we started very, with the basic science of understanding cognition uh, and then started working with applications and prototypes that have product influence eventually. So our team's done quite a bit, as well as other MSR teams, on search and browsing, uh, both for web search uh, as well as desktop search. In fact, uh, the, the Vista desktop search uh, was originally prototyped by our team as something called Stuff I've Seen, very much focused on memory, landmarks and memory. What you see here is an application we call Life Browser, and hopefully you'll see why we call this Life Browser in a, in a few seconds here. But what you see here on the left-hand column is an automatically constructed timeline that goes back 10 years for me. And on this timeline, the computer has automatically selected thumbnails by just it, uh, uh, crawling over my hard drive to find interesting, what it believes will be interesting memory landmarks, as well as video collections, uh, you see here in blue a uh, set of what, what, what the system has decided might be important landmarks in my meetings and appointments over time. And on the right, the system is bringing up what it thinks uh, over a period of time here, going back 10 years, are important landmarks in desktop activity. Uh, so notice I can have, I have a big slider here, and I can actually grab this slider and add more and more detail all the way up to where all these columns, all these, all these types of things are, are pretty uh, uh, um, detailed here. And so to manage information overload, the basic idea here is that we have even like a mix like you might see on an, on an audio system here. Let me see all my meetings. You see all that blue, how many meetings are on my calendar? But the system knows uh, uh, that w what the important ones are. Same for file activity. What you see here in red are, are, are files that I actually edited over time on these days. In, in black or, dar or dark gray or, or in getting darker towards black are things I just looked at without touching over time. And that's how that system uh, essentially works. Now, how does it do that? Well, behind the scenes, um, we have uh, Bayesian models that are trained by users. In this case, here is my uh, uh, Bayesian network, which is predicting which um, appointments are likely to be considered landmark appointments. And it turns out for me, it ter the attendees atypia, strange people coming to meetings, the strange organizer, organizer atypia. Uh, notions of um, uh, location. <laughs> strange for, for two years of my, of my appointment. It's unusual or atypical. Right, that's not unless strange people, but people that come very rarely to meetings, and so on. Um, thanks, Dan, for that. It's very apropos. No, notice also that the system uh, understands um, how to it uses Bayesian models to actually weave together experiences automatically from my collection. So I was in, in Venice a few weeks ago. And here's the system's view of, of what that was like. And if you had a little audio up, you'd hear like, it's an audio visual experience here, where, where, where a learned model can go through my hard drive and, and give me sort of a little holodeck experience for each thumbnail that I see. And of course, uh, there's also search here as well. So if I just put in, let's say I want to, I was at CMU a few, um, a couple months ago for an oral exam. I want to find that quickly here. And the, and the basic idea is uh, uh, we could do a, a search. And when you do a search, we, we bring up um, items that um, uh, the, the thumbnails will, will wrap around in time here. And so uh, and that, that those items fill the, 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 the right-hand right -hand column. It's like it's, uh, it's, it's uh, research software. This is just a research software, although some of the ideas have definitely gone into Microsoft products. So, it may take a little while for the results to come up here. Right. But anyway, but the idea is when, when they do come up, the, the la memory landmarks wrap around the search results in a way that 
uh, gives you a sense for um, uh, what happened in your life, what happened on your desktop uh, when these uh, events happened, in the, when, when, when these files uh, were created or these appointments occurred. So that's basically uh, where we're headed. We're actually looking more deeply at this technology for uh, both autobiographical tools beyond search, for experiential tools where you can sort of have a way of actually probing and experiencing uh, over time uh, uh, different events in your life. So it started out as a search browser and a search tool. All of a sudden we had something that people said, wow, I, I'd like to have that for autobi autobiographical kind of means, or I'd like to have this for uh, even memorializing uh, a set of trips. So I'll stop there. Great. Thank you, Eric. So let's move on to, to something a little bit different. And uh, this is a project about uh, interaction techniques and how we can interact with computers away from the desktop, or actually directly on the desktop, away <laughs> from a keyboard and mouse, uh, away from, let's say, using a portable device, but actually interacting directly with the flat surface. And Andy Wilson here will uh, say a few more words and show you a demo. Right, so uh, one of the big ideas in ubiquitous computing is the notion that that computation will actually be in your environment, in your everyday uh, space. So uh, your uh, little confusion around the, the notion of a desktop is, is completely right. uh, uh, appropriate. We've gone away from sort of this, this um, the real world. And what I'm going to show you right now is a prototype that we've been working on that brings back some of these tangible uh, real world aspects into computing. And there are some really interesting advantages to doing that. Now my background is in sensing. And um, so I like uh, computer vision and cameras. And sensing is actually a really um, very flexible uh, modality and technology. And so what we've got here is a projector and a camera. And the camera is trained on the very same region that the projector uh, uh, is, is displaying an image. And so we have this uh, nice co-location so we can um, put the, uh, my hand in front of the ball and the ball bounces uh, off the ball. Not, not right, a so terribly... What, so what you can't see on the screen is where his hand is. So well, you... Right, so well, there'll be some examples yeah. later of that, um, a little more visible. Right, so this is um, you know, not a particularly interesting example, but it at least gives you a flavor for uh, some of the minimal kinds of interactions you can, you can do with uh, computer vision. It's also a very flexible uh, modality so that I can... Um, uh, actually work with uh, real physical objects. These are little um, just acrylic plastic pieces with laser printed patterns on them. And as I put these down on the surface, uh, we get um, uh, these, these graphical objects. And this is not a real application. We're just running through some of the technical capabilities of the system. So these could be um, game pieces, obviously, or they could have any sort of functionality um, you know, the an application designer can come up with. We put it down. Maybe it's a knob for uh, controlling the parameters of some search or volume and uh, media playback. Um, just continuing in that vein, here's just a regular piece of paper. Um, as, I, as I put that piece of paper down on the surface, uh, the system sees that and, um, and projects a, a video onto that. And so as I move the piece of paper around, uh, the video uh, keeps up with that piece of paper. And so it's, a, it's an interesting um, uh, uh, thing to think about, like what kinds of things would you use in a real interface where you have real objects. And so I'm going to show a couple little more vignettes real quickly of, uh, and so this is technology that uses a lot of uh, computer vision techniques which is a, an area that we got into about 10 years ago at Microsoft Research. And at the time, we really had no idea of why computer research might be an important technical area. And it's a good example of, of some of the things that Rick Rash had turned, uh, talked about earlier. But as we've moved into this digital era, we have found more and more uses of how to apply computer vision. So one of the capabilities uh, that we're looking at is uh, this notion that you can have you can actually put your hands directly on the data that you're manipulating and, and really get, move beyond the single uh, cursor model, single point cursor model that you find in, in Windows, for example. So the idea here is I have this, uh, this map that, that's being drawn off of the um, Windows Live Local database in real time. And as I put my hands on this data, I can manipulate it uh, rather like it was a real map. And as you, as you see there, it's actually pulling in uh, that, the tile data, the images. Uh, from the server. 
And so it's a very natural kind of interaction. It's a little bit like a, like a real map. Of course, you can't um, pull a real map in and out like this. So this is a, an interesting kind of um, uh, idea that, that we're looking into. You know, what are the kinds of situations where this um, being able to put your hands directly on the data makes sense? And the neat thing here is that if, if you know how to manipulate a piece of paper on a desk, chances are you can get this to work. Notice that if I have just my one hand on the, on the uh, desktop, I can rotate it. If I have um, two hands, I can rotate it. And so that's something that is very interesting to look at these different interaction techniques that this sensing affords. And so for the, the final um, idea, we're, we're also looking at different ways to incorporate the, the uh, multiple devices, mobile devices, as they're placed onto the desktop. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take a, a quick picture um, using this camera phone. This is a Windows Mobile 5 um, smartphone. And let's quickly uh, take a picture of you all here. And then, so I'm going to pl then place the um, phone down on the surface. And um, oop, it's going to enable the, the whole, that part of the demo. As I place the phone down on the surface, uh, it then notices that there is um, a Bluetooth-enabled phone. It connects to it and begins to pull off uh, camera phone photos. So you can imagine that if I have, uh, if I meet with you face to someone face to face, you, they can put their phone down. I can put my phone down, and we can exchange uh, photos or contact information, what have you. And the idea is that any device that's placed on the surface is connected by you having uh, placed it there. And then I can manipulate this um, this photo, rather like the map. And so it's just a very natural kind of interaction. And then when I want to disconnect. I just simply pick up the phone and walk away. So it's a very natural, we don't have to mess around with Bluetooth um, pairing processes. And so this is actually using a technology called Blue Rendezvous, which is also uh, a separate project in MSR. So that's great. And I understand that um, this was so exciting that uh, another company has actually licensed this technology. So another company is licensing Touchlight, that's right, which is a related technology to this. Right. And so this, this whole approach of, of using uh, computer vision to enable new kinds of interactions is really getting uh, some really interesting, uh, enabling some really interesting new capabilities in, in this demo here. Thanks, Andy. Thanks. So let's uh, continue on to the um, subject of having a lot of data and information and what you can do about it. So one thing that you can do about that is um, to apply some machine intelligence, as Eric showed. And as part of this demo, you also sort of showed that there were ways of uh, using some visualization techniques, sort of improving the way the data is displayed so that it can really harness the capability of the human visual system. And uh, George Robertson here is going to show you a few more examples of that uh, crafted for very specific audiences. And I think the first set of audiences is actually uh, programmers at Microsoft. Thank you, Dan. Yes, the, um I want to show you two things that we've done uh, to help programmers. Uh, this first one is called Code Thumbnails, and it's designed to help an individual. I think you have to push um, a button or something. Oh, right. OK, so this is uh, Code Thumbnails. We are actually looking at uh, Visual Studio, which is uh, an environment that a lot of programmers use. And what we've done is to replace the normal scroll bar for the editing window with this uh, code thumbnail, which is a, uh, a snapshot of the entire file that you're looking at, uh, shrunken down so that it fits on the entire screen. And it, essentially, it replaces uh, the scroll bar. Uh, and the other interesting thing about it is that it highlights um, the methods and classes of interest. So if I want to move. For example, to this method, I just click on this, and it will uh, move me to that location. Now, so it, it gives you a way of very quickly getting to arbitrary parts of this particular file that we're editing. Uh, then we take these individual code thumbnails and lay them out on a, uh, uh, a desktop. 
and arrange it in whatever way is appropriate for the particular pro uh, project that you're working on. And um, so we're taking advantage of human spatial memory here, making it easy for you to remember exactly where the relevant files are. And again, if I uh, select one of these and click on it, um, the uh, editor will move to that file and to that particular location in the file. Um, an another feature is, uh, let me go back to this file and um, to this particular method. Uh, if I do a find in files um, and look for this particular method name, then it's going to highlight all of the instances within this particular code thumbnail. And um, if we look at the, at the desktop view, you see where uh, all instances of that particular thing occur and which files they're in. So these, this tool helps an individual programmer get their work done. The, the next question is, how do we help a team of programmers get their work done? And what we've done there is to create a system called FastDash. Uh, this is for uh, shared team awareness. And it's, uh, uh, it would be a dashboard put up on a display surface uh, in a common location where everyone on the team could see it. And it's showing us a lot of information about what's going on with this particular uh, project that's being worked on. So uh, it's showing the check marks here are showing all of the files that are checked out. The uh, blue uh, items are all of the files that are currently opened and being viewed by someone on the team. And the picture uh, on the right shows you who's viewing the file. The uh, orange outlines are the files that are actually being edited at the moment. And it's actually telling you which method is being edited. And then this is a particularly interesting case. The uh, crosshatch area is a warning sign that's saying this particular file is checked out by two people. Uh, so that's a potential conflict that you need to be aware of. Now, this of. could obviously be used for other groups of people rather than programmers. Sure. So collaborating on other things, an advertising campaign or a, you know, some, some other collaborative effort, right? That's right. Absolutely. So uh, those two systems uh, help individual programmers and groups of programmers. Another area that uh, we've been looking at is uh, helping in business situations. This particular um, uh, system is called a schema mapper. Uh, it was originally, the concept was originally developed by the BizTalk uh, product. And um, the problem they're trying to solve here is, uh, in, a, in businesses, you typically have um, schemas uh, that describe sort of industry standard information. And then you have a custom schema for a particular business or a particular application. A simple and example of that is when you're importing a database that usually has a schema that's different from your own database. Right, right. Uh, so the problem there is that you need to define a mapping between this generic uh, schema and a particular schema. So uh, what BizTalk did was come up with this basic idea that they have one schema, the source schema on the left, the destination schema inverted on the right, and then a mapping in the middle that shows the uh, the uh, relationship between the two. Um, and one of the problems with this, uh, the interesting thing about this is that when BizTalk first introduced it five years ago, a number of other companies picked up the idea. And there are like eight companies out there that all use the same basic technique. Uh, the problem with it is that customers immediately start working with larger and larger schemas and larger and larger maps and uh, very quickly get to the point where the mapping is just uh, too confusing. To There's too much information there. It's a lot of clutter, uh, particularly with the, the technique that was being used for tracing through. So if I wanted to find out what this is connected to, I actually had to uh, trace through and move things around. And uh, not very easy to figure out what it's connected to. So we have applied a number of visualization uh, techniques. And I'll just turn them all on so you can see the end result of this. Uh, the end result is when I select something, uh, it will um, find all of the connected items. Um, it will highlight those items and de-emphasize everything else. It will auto-pan the uh, map to the so that the 
interesting stuff is in the center. It also auto scrolls the two uh, tree views so that the interesting stuff is in the center. So we've taken a really difficult problem and turned it into something that, uh, where the interesting stuff is very salient and very easy to work with. Okay, so that's a business application. Um, now you've been thinking about consumers as well. Yes. So um, two things, two examples for consumers. Uh, this first one uh, has to do with how uh, a consumer gets to a large amount of information on a small device like a smartphone. So what we built is this system called Fathom, which uh, stands for Faceted Thumb-Based Interface. Um, and basically, uh, the phone display is broken into three major regions. There's a, a re region here that shows the various facets, which are uh, that there's uh, metadata associated with whatever data you're looking at. In this case, what we're looking at is Yellow Pages information for Seattle and the east side. Um, so there's a hierarchy of, of uh, metadata that you can explore in this part so of the should, display. You should give some examples. There's the category, the distance right. to the, the place, the location of the place, yep. when, when they're open, so on. Yep. And then the region right above that is the current uh, results of your browsing or search activity. Um, and one interesting thing is that we always show some results, so you're never seeing an empty screen. Now, the question is, suppose I wanted to find something like uh, uh, a really nice, uh, say, an expensive uh, Italian restaurant near my home. Um, there are, because this is a faceted uh, system, there are multiple ways to get the answer to that. There are lots of ways you could find the answer. If you were using a, a traditional um, a search system, you would have to type in a bunch of keywords, which you all know is very difficult on a phone. In this system, what we do instead is I'm going to go down uh, category, uh, restaurants, ethnicity, uh, Italian, and now I'm going to pin that one, go back up to the top, and now go down the distance facet. So distance from home, uh, say 10 blocks. That's now um, five different uh, restaurants that fit that. And now I can order these by uh, price is what I was interested in. So uh, Nick's Italian Cuisine is an expensive Italian restaurant close to home. Pizza yeah. and Sandwich is probably not an expensive restaurant, even <laughs> though it says that up there. Well, some of the data that we, we're using uh, real Yellow Pages data, but the Yellow Pages, you know, don't, doesn't have price information. So we kind of randomly introduced some price information so that we could develop this concept. So right. the price information is not correct, but the rest of it is. Um, okay, this same idea can be applied on a larger scale, too. And, and for that, we created a, a system called Facet Map. Um, this particular data that we're looking at is uh, actually um, information about uh, Gordon Bell from the My Life Bit Bits um, project. We, we should uh, probably explain that a little bit. So Gordon Bell is a, a uh, principal researcher at Microsoft Research, and he's been really interested in collecting almost everything he does in digital form and saving it. So that's all pictures all websites he's ever seen, all phone calls he's ever made, all documents he's ever written, and so on. So he's been sort of doing that as an experiment, essentially taking his entire life, digitizing it, and keeping it online. Right, and the original interface that was built for that was a kind of a traditional text-oriented uh, search engine. And uh, we took the challenge of seeing if we could do a completely visual way of gaining access to this information. So this is, again, a faceted uh, browsing and searching system. Uh, the major facets here are things like uh, date and uh, people and uh, type of communication, um, uh, the time spent on a particular item. So if we dive in and look at an example, like uh, if we focus on the year 2004, what it will show on the right is the uh, uh, all of the items that have that 2004 attribute, and on the left, all of the remaining facets given that you're filtering on 2004. 
So now we can look at pictures within 2004 and then uh, notice that the main facet that's left is location. So we could go and look at, say, San Francisco uh, pictures in 2004. And uh, now you've gotten down to a smaller set. So it, we were very easily to get down to some particular uh, thing of interest in a very large database with, with just a few keystrokes and no typing at all. Now, another interesting thing about this particular technique is that it's completely scalable. It will work in whatever size uh, window I put it in. So if I make it smaller, it will um, go smaller. The same visual representation and interaction techniques work regardless of the size. And in particular, it works on a really large display. That 18-panel display at the far end of the room has the same information that I've been showing you, just shown on a really large display. But, that, but here you've been able to be much more explicit about uh, many more of the facets. That's right. right. OK, great. Thank you, George. Thank you. So for our last station, um, we're going to show you some of our work in the computer graphics and computer vision area. As you heard a little bit earlier, some of the, the computer vision technology was used in Andy's uh, Play Anywhere system. But we've applied it also to uh, digital media. So about 10 years ago, um, Michael Cohen, who does uh, computer graphics, uh, ran into Rick Zaliski, who does computer vision. And they chatted and realized that each field only did about 90% of what they wanted to do. For the computer graphics guys, the problem was, how do I create really complex, uh, real, realistic models that I can then show in a computer graphics system? And for the computer vision guys, it's really quite the opposite, which is how can we extract a very complicated model from a series of pictures? And I'll turn it over to Michael for the rest of the story. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, so as Dan alluded to, we both had problems in that we could solve about 90% of the problem, but the key was we couldn't create models as rich as we find in the real world. In other words, describing everything in all its detail. So this launched a whole new area uh, called image-based rendering. Uh, so for example here, if we took this fuzzy lion and asked the computer vision researchers what would we get, we would get a model that might look like this. It would be a pretty good representation, but didn't have all the little hairs. But at the same time, every pixel of those photographs we could use in combination with this model using our traditional graphics pipeline to create new images. And this launched an idea uh, that was called Lumograph. This was one of the papers that Rick alluded to that showed up at SIGGRAPH in 1996. This is 10-year-old work. Uh, and this is one of the original Lumographs. It's as if we took a camera and we, we took a few pictures of this lion. And what we're able to do then is look at this line as if we were looking through a window. So all these images that you see here are being assembled on the fly by picking and choosing pixels from all those different photographs that were taken of this, of this lion. Now let's jump forward about seven or eight years, and I'll show you where that, that work has led to. So the, uh, we're, we're switching videos to the other, to this laptop here. They did this. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it was earlier. It was working it's earlier. It's on D. There you go. Uh huh. Okay. So, what we're seeing here is um, a video called Massive Arabesque. And um, I'll start the video playing and uh, tell you what's happening. So in this video here, we have a local uh, rap dance group uh, called the Massive Monkeys. And we're filming it using a series of cameras. So what you're going to see is the kind of freeze frame effect that you've seen maybe in um, the Matrix movie. that uh, Some people call it bullet time. And the way that's traditionally done is you set up a series of maybe 40 or 100 video cameras. And uh, then by switching rapidly between the different video cameras, you can get these visual effects. What we did in our case is we only used seven cameras, so this is a much more manageable setup that you can imagine using commonly in studio situations. And we're using these image-based rendering techniques, which basically build up a 3D model of the scene. And then that allows us to fly around a virtual camera from place to place. So when you saw a little, a few minutes ago, 
uh, the person being shown in sort of multiple views at the same time, that's because we have a 3D model and we can blend different versions of this 3D model, render them together, and look at them from different points of view. So it's a natural evolution of the work that Michael showed you, um, where we started with a camera, just a, a regular photo camera, taking multiple shots, and now we're doing it with video, so we get the, um, the element of time back in. So we think this is a precursor to what in the future we're going to see uh, in terms of 3D television. So I'm going to stop the uh, video here, and Matt's going to come over and talk a little bit more about, um, about some of our image stitching work. So we've tried to give you a little bit of a historical perspective here on this work. OK. Um, so, so digital photography is huge today, right? And digital cameras are great because they let photographers and people take lots of photos for pretty much free. And a question we asked was, can we apply some of our computer vision techniques to help people organize their photo collections and to make better pictures? So, so here's one application of that. We have a, a small group of photos here. And some of these photos are just individual snapshots. But um, this set of photos here, the photographer's intent was to rotate the camera because they couldn't capture this whole panoramic scene in one image. So if we just select all the photos in this directory and tell our software to help us organize these, let, let's see what it does. So I've selected everything there. and. I'll just have it automatically organize it. Uh, while it's doing that, I'll show another sort of collection of images that the photographer was changing a setting in the camera because their intent, again, this was a very bright scene. It had lots of detail in the highlights and simultaneously details in the shadows, and they couldn't capture that in one image. So, um, so they took multiple exposures. But you, know, you don't really want that as multiple exposures in your directory. So, our software's gone off and organized this directory for us. And here it's automatically found that panoramic view for us. And I double click on that. Let's see what it looks like. Take a second to assemble. And here it's assembled that automatically for us into the, the panoramic view that the photographer was intending to capture. Um, we'll also look at the this scene, which we call, which had the multiple exposures in it. We call this a high dynamic range scene. I can tweak it a little bit here. And now we've assembled this into a, into a, a composite image that has detail both in the highlights and in the shadows. Um, so this, we've let people internally play with the software, and they've, they've applied this to years and years of photo collections. This is just a small example. And the fun thing is that it helps you find sort of similarities between photos that you didn't even know were there in your collection. And Rick will show like a follow-on idea of this in, in Photosynth later, where you're assembling um, uh, links between photos. So here's sort of a collection of images I shot, or two images I shot last year in France that I didn't even know overlapped with each other, but it, it automatically found it and created a panorama for me. Um, so another reason you might want to shoot multiple pictures is something we call a group shot. And it found this group shot for us in our collection. And Michael's going to describe this to you. So the, the stitching software that you saw is now uh, has showed up in Digital Image Pro and in the Expression Suite. Uh, we have another tool that you can go download for free that we're just putting off of our uh, Microsoft Research site. It's called GroupShot. And as you saw, uh, two of the images in that directory you just saw were these two, which were was our colleague Alex and his wife Heather. Now, he took these by just holding a camera out at arm's length and taking a couple of pictures of himself. The first thing that happened is it aligned those images, just like it was doing the stitching for that, that uh, wide panorama. But the problem is, of course, if you've ever taken pictures of more than one person or even one person at a time, is Heather looks good in this one with her eyes open. And Alex, of course, looks good in this one. And neither picture is really what you want. So let's just focus on Heather first. And we can look at Heather and say, well, this one looks good. So I'll select this one. And now let's go back and focus on Alex. And as we focus on Alex, you can see, well, he looks good in the other one, so I'll select that one. What the system has done is automatically gone in and found exactly the right place to cut between those two images to create a seamless image that's good for both of them. Now, if we're really picky, we go back and see this woman was walking by, and we didn't really like that. Of course, in the first image, she wasn't there. 
And now in just three clicks, we've created the kind of image that we were really hoping to get, but never actually existed at any particular instant in time. It was rather this moment of them standing on the beach is the one that you can not believe in photographs anymore. Okay. So let me turn it back over uh, to Rick and take this idea to, to its next step. So um, one of the things that Matt showed you is that you can create these very nice big panoramas. And I want to focus a little bit now on the viewing experience because you saw the authoring side. And um, what we're looking at here is one of these big panoramas. How many of you have been up to Deception Falls on the way to Stevens Pass? Do you, do you know that waterfall? It's a beautiful area. So um, this is a panorama I took. There's my dad because we were there a few years ago. And I took all of these photographs and stitched them using our software. But what we did in addition to that is I also had a video camera. And with the video camera, I basically stitched in the waterfall. So now you have this 360 panorama, which you might be familiar with for doing things like real estate tours. You see that very often. But we've actually added the video. There's the sound. So you sort of get a real immersive sense of being in this three-dimensional environment. And it's all done using a combination of photography and video like this. So this is one kind of immersive tour you can do. And this one I captured basically by taking a camera on a tripod and, and taking a few dozen photographs and then taking a video. Now, the next one I want to show you is one where uh, we're actually going to do this for a home tour. And um, so I'm going to launch this thing here. And what we're looking at is uh, a home. It happens to actually be the house that uh, Dan was living in uh, a few years ago. And we're going to do this tour here where basically we're going to go into the house and see what it looks like. So again, for those of you who are familiar with 360 tours inside people's homes, usually you're just jumping from one room to another. There's not this sense of movement, of continuous movement. And we basically can move through here and look at all the details you can see. See, this is a beautiful home, and we can go around and select different rooms to go into, so we can either go left into the guest bedroom or stay straight across this bridge that's in the middle of the atrium. And look at all the visual effects. You see the reflection off of the copper floors. If we look this way, uh, we have um, the reflections off of the, uh, the fireplace to the right here. So there's an incredible sense of visual richness that you don't get just from still photographs. This is like a combination of gaming technology because you really get to have free movement inside the thing, but it's based on real world imagery. So it has an incredible realism that in traditional games is very hard to get because there you typically just have surfaces with painted textures on them. So there's an incredible richness here. Now, in order to do this, we couldn't take a camera and put it on a tripod and take a shot and then move the tripod over. That would have been much too slow. So what we did instead was we built this special 360 camera. This one. That, that uh, red thing you see there is, a, is actually a video camera that looks in six different directions at the same time. You can put it on your head and walk around inside a home or a garden. And then when you get it back to the lab, we process it and create this kind of a, a three-dimensional tour. So um, this is really exciting for real estate applications. But it turns out it also has applications in uh, documentary journalism. And Matt's going to tell us a little bit about how MSNBC used this. OK. Let's bring up a website here. Um, so uh, we did that home tour about three years ago um, and developed that, the camera for that project. And the technology was sort of, actually, the camera literally sat on my shelf for the last three years. We weren't sure. We, we give lots of demos. We're not sure where this is going to be applied. And um, I met some people from MSNBC who were doing a project called Rising from Ruin uh, to document the, the devastation of Hurricane Katrina on two towns in Mississippi called Waveland and Bay St. Louis. Um, and I showed them the demo of the home tour. And they, they were trying to tell the story of, of the of Hurricane Katrina in these two towns. And you know, a single snapshot doesn't really uh, tell the story of the devastation. That, uh, there's this wide scale devastation. So they thought that this technology could help them tell that story. And here's, uh, I just brought up the Rising from Ruin website. And we'll click on uh, some of the footage that we captured down there using this 360 technology. So here we go. We um, geo-referenced everything. So the, every frame in this 360 video has a GPS tag associated with it. So we can see where we're driving along in, in Waveland, Mississippi here. And at any point, we can drag around and just see the, the devastation everywhere. And we, we, we rented a, we 
took a rental car and mounted the camera on the roof and just drove around Waveland and Bay St. Louis for a few days um, to create this experience. And everywhere you can stop and drag, look around, you have a full immersive experience everywhere inside this tour. And it really, I think, helps tell this story a lot better than a single, a single image could. So this is on live on MSNBC's this is on live, the, website, is, so I'm, any of you can I'm streaming this off their website right now. Here's the, the URL is up here in the, in the address bar. So we did a, a more somber home tour in Waveland, and there's some audio with this too. So this is a, a homeowner taking us through his home. And as he describes how the hurricane affected his home at any point, you can stop and look around and see, see what he's talking about. This was, this was actually a wall with French doors that opened. Again, so one of the challenges here was um, the, the reporter who was doing the story wore the, the helmet on his head. And as you watch this, you, can't really, you don't really see the, the head bobbing motion that he had. So one of the software challenges we, we had was to make this look like it was shot from a stable platform, even though this was shot from the top of somebody's head. And that's, that's some of the, the technology we were able to apply to this this application. Okay, and I think Mike is, Michael is next. Yeah. Great, thanks. So we were thinking about this, this all the stitching software we had, putting it, essentially assembling imagery from multiple cameras and thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could make really, really big pictures? Uh, pictures that are so large that we're able to, to essentially tell a story with a single image by just looking around in it. So what Matt and I did was we went up on top of a building uh, in Seattle, and we had a rig that looks like this. We now have a new rig, which you can which see. Over here. You can see over here that we're using uh, for the future. And what we were able to do was essentially to scan the world that we were looking at. And it looked something like this. If you've ever been, you, this was taken from this building top on Capitol Hill. The nice thing about this image is that it's, it's not just a single image. It's, in fact, a collection of a lot of things going on in Seattle at that, on that morning in February. So you can all see the, the pair of gloves in the image, right? No, can't really see it? So, of course, there's some uh, construction site down here, and so the workers are going to have to wear a pair of gloves as they do their work. And you all saw the, uh, the owl up on the building, right? The nice thing about this is we didn't really find most of these things. We have let a lot of people play with this image. And just looking over their shoulders, they kept discovering these various things uh, hidden around Seattle. And it was only uh, recently that we were watching somebody, and they started zooming in here. And up on our wall upstairs, we have a printout that's about six feet wide and about three feet high. But even on that one, if you put your nose right up against it, you would not see this airplane, which is probably <laughs> flying somewhere over Japan, I think. Um, in fact, if you were to print out the image with the airplane this big, that, that photograph, that printout would be larger than the entire building that we're sitting in. Um, so this is one way to, to assemble lots of photographs from a single point of view into a big, big picture. Um, I'm now going to turn it back over to Rick to show uh, some of our latest technology for assembling different so types of settings. How many pictures was this, Michael? This was about 800 images. And in the end, what you're looking at here is a four gigapixel image, essentially about four billion pixels all assembled together into a single image. So uh, the last uh, project we're going to show you is something called Photosynth. And this actually originated as a joint research project between uh, Microsoft Research and the University of Washington. So um, I, both Michael and I, uh, co advise students at the University of Washington and one of the students, Noah Snavely, and his advisor, Steve Seitz, and I uh, developed this system called Phototourism, which was shown at SIGGRAPH uh, past summer. And the idea there was to take large collections of photographs and actually see if they could be rearranged in 3D. So a lot of the stuff we've shown you up till now are panoramas taken from the same point of view. Uh, with Photosynth, you can start with a large collection of photographs. So as I hit this fly around button, look for the little red triangles. Those are where the photographs were taken. Um, so one of the developers on this project, uh, Jonathan Doogie, uh, was in uh, Rome 
uh, a few months ago, and he took a few hundred photographs in St. Peter's Square. And all of these photographs are automatically registered by the system. The system figures out where the person was standing for each photograph and builds this kind of sketchy 3D model. So we're not trying to build a completely realistic 3D model like you might find in a computer game. What we're trying to do is basically take the photographs and allow you to navigate the scene by moving from one photo to the next. So if I put my mouse in the middle here, I can say, oh, okay, let me see what's to the right of this photograph. And it basically brings in the next photo and lets you move from one photo to the next. So we can go and do a tour all the way around the side of the um, square. And you get a very strong sense of three-dimensional movement, but you never take away the beauty of the photographs. So just like with uh, the home tour we had uh, previously, we, we keep the photography around. And this is one of the common themes in this whole field of image-based rendering, is to let the photographs, the realism of the real world, shine through. So we basically go all the way back to the original basilica here. And now if you want to see something like a detail, you can go look at this photograph and say, oh, okay, I'd like to see a nice detail shot of the cupola here. So you can do that. And again, anytime you want to, you can fly around and overlook the scene. And we could actually click on one of these little triangles and uh, jump to some other part of the scene. So this is the latest thing coming out of our group. Um, the system, which is actually has been built and re-engineered inside Microsoft, inside our Live Labs uh, group, is called Photosynth. And we've demoed this at SIGGRAPH. It's going to be going live in a few weeks. Uh, so that people can explore these collections on their own. And it's just another example of how research that starts off in the lab in a very academic context uh, can quickly make it into Microsoft products. Um, that's just the way we're set up here. And in fact, this is a great example also of a 10-year view of a research program to see how kind of these ideas started and where it's all evolved uh, over the past 10 years, and then some ideas of, of new things that we're planning to do with this technology. That's great. So thank you very much for, for coming today. I think we've tried to show you just a little bit about some of the projects going on at Microsoft Research and uh, tried to highlight a little bit of the historical perspective, point out some uh, interesting ways that we've um, both impacted products as well as licensed our technology and also worked with universities in the case of this Photosynth project. So thank you very much again for coming. Thanks, Dan. Thanks to all the researchers who helped with that. Um, we're going to set up now for Q&A, bring uh, Dan and, and Rick back up here. While, while they come on up, we have, I got one more video to share with you. This one won't be quite as funny as the last one, but it, it's it's fun and exciting anyway. Well, you know, as, as Rick mentioned this morning, one of the things that's very important for us here at Microsoft Research is making sure that the field of computer science is healthy. And uh, the, those who, who follow this closely will know that uh, there's been a significant drop off in computer science enrollment over the last few years. And uh, it's obviously something of great concern to us. And one of the things that, that we've been trying to do is, is work with some of the association organizations, work with uh, even a high school guidance council is trying to get better information out there about um, why this field is so exciting, why we're all in it, why this is a great, you know, great uh, career, a great field to be in. And so um, we actually, last video I want to show you is a video that we put together we're actually sharing with those, those partners uh, uh, to really help sort of get the message a little better out about, you know, why we think this is such a great field to be in. So let's go ahead and play the video.
I hate glass. Yeah. <laughs>